The case you're about to see is a fictional one, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. No doubt. Anyway, we'll soon have this little lot sorted out. Right old pantomime, isn't it? Please stand. Are you Barbara May Truscott? Yes. Barbara May Truscott, in this indictment, you stand charged with theft, contrary to Section 1 of the Theft Act 1968. The particulars of this offence being that you, on the 18th day of February 1977, in the area of Greater Fulchester, stole a tin of salmon, the property of Paradise Supermarkets Limited. To this indictment, do you plead guilty or not guilty? Oh, dear. Not guilty. Yes, Mrs. Transcott, you may sit down now. Some water, Mr. Carrigan? You might at least have waited till the jury got here. <laughs> Will you tell the court, please, Mrs. Waterman, where you were at the time of the alleged offence? I was walking through the supermarket, trundling one of those store trolleys and dressed as an ordinary housewife. And what, in fact, were you doing? I was on duty as a store detective. Now, Mrs. Waterman, you are the area security officer for Paradise Supermarkets, are you not? Yes, sir. You see, before we get into any further detail, I'm sure the thought going through the minds of the members of the jury is why a case like this the theft of a small item not worth more than a few shillings should result in a prosecution. It was a seven and a half ounce tin of red salmon, sir. I know that, Mrs. Waterman. Fancy grade. Fancy grade. The price was one pound sixteen p, not just a few shillings. It is the most common form of shoplifting, the smallest item with the highest price. Yes, but even so, I'm sure the members of the jury will be wondering why such a large organisation as Paradise Supermarkets should think it worthwhile instituting a prosecution which can only result in expense to themselves and distress to others, out of all proportion to the theft of a small, albeit relatively expensive, tin of salmon. In 1973, sir, a Home Office report criticised firms like ours for failing to prosecute shoplifters. They recommended that the police be notified of all future cases, including those involving the very young and the very old. We simply followed those Home Office recommendations. I wasn't criticising you, Mrs Waterman, merely seeking some idea of your policy in a matter which might interest the jury. You have to remember that it's thefts like these, sir, that contribute towards the figure of goods worth £550 million being stolen each year from shops throughout the country. Quite so. And this must add to the price of the goods in the shop, no doubt. It increases the housewife shopping bill by at least twopence in the pound. Two p in the pound. Mr. Carrigan, is your client seriously ill? Is she able to carry on? Uh, no, sir. Although, unfortunately, this trial is causing Mrs. Truscott more than a little anxiety. Yes. Miss Davenport. Mrs. Waterman. During the course of your duties on the morning of Friday the 18th of February, was there a time when you saw the defendant in the supermarket? Yes, there was. Can you tell the court, in your own words please, what you saw? I saw Mrs Truscott walking along the tin meat and fish section of the supermarket. She was carrying a wire basket with some other items of food in it and she stopped in front of the week's special offer. Which was? Pilchards. Pilchards? Yes, sir. Not salmon. No, the salmon was just to the left of the pilchards. Ah, oh, yes, the, the red salmon. Both red and pink, sir. Yes. Mrs Truscott stopped in front of the pilchards, looked over each shoulder in turn. I was standing about six feet away from her, to her left at the time, moved towards the shelf of salmon and put one of the tins into a shopping bag. And could you see all this quite clearly? Yes. And what did you do next? I followed Mrs Truscott to the checkout till where she paid for all the articles in the wire basket, but made no attempt to pay for the tin of salmon. 
I apprehended her after she had left the supermarket and told her I was a store detective from Paradise and that I had reason to believe she had stolen a tin of salmon. And did Mrs Truscott say anything at that time? Yes, she said, don't speak so loudly. Then what happened? I asked her to open a shopping bag and inside it was a seven and a half ounce tin of Paradise Red Salmon. May she be shown exhibit one? Is that the tin of salmon? Yes. And when you found that tin of salmon in Mrs Truscott's shopping bag, what did you do? I asked her to accompany me to one of the offices where a member of the staff kept an eye on her while I phoned the police from another room. Now, Mrs Waterman, was there anything about Mrs Truscott's behaviour at any time, either in the supermarket when you saw her pick up the tin of salmon and put it in her shopping bag, or later outside when you apprehended her, to suggest that she might not be in full control of her faculties. No, she seemed perfectly normal. It was a simple case of premeditated theft. Thank you, Mrs. Waterman. Will you wait there, please? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Waterman, before you gained employment with Paradise Supermarkets as a security officer, you served as a detective constable with the Fulchester Police Force, did you not? That's right. Uh, how long a period was this? Just over six years. Now, what considerations persuaded you to abandon the Fulchester Police Force, Mrs. Waterman? My husband uh, thought I'd be better off in a less demanding and dangerous job. Yes, and doubtless one which uh, also had the additional attraction of being more financially rewarding. Yes. Mrs Waterman, was not your decision to resign from the Fulchester Police Force occasioned by the fact that there had been complaints of corruption against you? Certainly not. There were no complaints? There was one complaint, but it did not influence my decision to leave the police force. What was the complaint, Mrs Waterman? A pub landlord claimed I'd demanded money from him in return for not pursuing charges in a case of underage drinking. There was a full police inquiry and I was completely exonerated. Now, this was before the recent legislation which now requires civilians as well as police to be involved in uh, investigation of complaints against the police. Yes. Mr. Carrigan, I think you've gone quite far enough in that direction, don't you? As you wish, sir. And in view of the fact that you apparently find it necessary to consult your instructing solicitor about almost every question you ask, I would willingly grant you a short adjournment that you might learn the details of your client's case. I appreciate your concern, sir, but uh, that won't be necessary. Very good. Well, let's get on then, shall we? I'd like to return to the morning of the alleged theft. Sir? When you chance to espy Mrs. Truscott lurking in the vicinity of the special offer of pilchard. Do you see she, she looked over both shoulders? Yes, sir. Would you be so good as to demonstrate to the court, Mrs. Waterman, the manner in which Mrs. Truscott performed this manoeuvre? And I put it to you, Mrs. Waterman, that the movement you saw was not that of a, a villain with criminal intent, but more like this. The movement of a somewhat anxious, middle-aged lady trying to clear her head. Didn't look like that to me. And I also put it to you, Mrs. Waterman, and this is no criticism of you, since you had no way of knowing at the time, that my client was suffering from the effects of tranquilizers prescribed to her by her family doctor. Oh, dear. Sir? Every time a case of shoplifting comes before me, the defendant appears to be a person who claims to be either drunk, congenitally absent-minded, or whose mind is befuddled with the use of tranquilizers. Now, there are more and more of these drugs being prescribed every year, so perhaps that would explain their involvement in shoplifting. As with alcohol, they could be implicated in other cases as well. Now, will you, Mrs. Waterman, tell me were you aware that Mrs. Truscott was being prescribed tranquilizers by her doctor? Not at the time, no. In fact, far from deliberately putting the tin of salmon into her shopping basket, it was an act of which she had no conscious knowledge whatsoever. I've no idea. 
As I said before, Mrs. Truscott was in full control of her faculties. Miss Fenton, you work at Paradise Supermarket as a shelf filler. Is that correct? Yeah. Have you ever met Mrs. Truscott, the lady over there? I sometimes seen her walking around the supermarket, yeah. Did you ever speak to her? Only about the weather, price of coffee, stuff like that. Did you see her on the morning of Friday, February the 18th this year? Yeah. Where did you see her? I was filling the pet foods and she asked me if I had anything else apart from what was on the shelves and I told her we hadn't. Did she appear any different from usual? No. Now was there a time on that morning, apart from the time when you talked to Mrs Truscott by the pet foods, when you found yourself alone with the defendant? Yeah. When was that? Mrs Waterman asked me to keep an eye on her while she felt law. Did you have a conversation with Mrs Truscott? Yeah. It was getting near dinner time, so I asked her if she wanted a corned beef butty. And what did Mrs Truscott say? She said, as long as the bread was fresh, could she have marge, not butter, and no mustard? Did there come a time when she asked you for something from her handbag? Yeah. When we had a cup of tea, she asked for a pills because she had to take one three times a day. And did you give them to her? Yeah. Did you read the name of the drug on the label? Didn't have to, did I? Modrium weren't, they know them anywhere. Well, what makes you say that? We live on Brentwood Estate. The windows is always getting busted, my dad's on dole and there's rats in the kitchen. And my mum couldn't stand it no more, so she went to the doctor. Couldn't give her no money or a better house, so he gave her them Modrium instead. Did Mrs Truscott take any of these tablets? Yeah, she took one. Just one? Yeah. And did her behaviour change in any way for the rest of the time you were with her? No. No. Did Mrs Truscott make any remark about whether or not she deliberately stole the tin of salmon? Yeah. What remark did she make? It was when I asked her about her old man. Her father, you mean? No, her husband. Oh, what did she say about her husband? She said, I expect he'll try to bully me into pleading not guilty. But, Miss Fenton, that remark tells us nothing about whether or not Mrs Truscott committed a deliberate act of theft, does it? Of course it does. She wanted to plead guilty and get it over with, but she knew her old man won't let her. It's ridiculous. The girl's expressing an opinion. Mr Truscott. My involuntary response to the disturbance we have just witnessed has, of course, resulted in the revelation to the jury and to the court that your instructing solicitor is, in fact, the husband of the defendant. Now, I have so far assumed, Mr. Carrigan, and I trust that I have assumed correctly, that it is not your intention to call Mr. Truscott to give evidence as a witness for the defence. Yes, sir, your assumption is quite correct. And uh, we should also like the court to understand that we do not feel that our case has been in any way harmed by your unintentional revelation. Good. Let's get on then. Now, Miss Fenton, your uh, earlier description of Mrs. Truscott's behaviour was that it was fussy, I believe. Yeah, dead fussy. And any further dimensions you, you could add to that perhaps somewhat sparse description? What like? Well, well her speed of movement, for example. Uh, would you describe that as lively or lethargic? What's lethargic? Well, uh, sluggish, slow moving. Yeah, that. Apart from being lethargic and dead fussy whenever you conversed with her in the supermarket, did she appear to you to be a woman with a, a clear, sharp mind or a somewhat vague mind? I know what you're trying to say. Now, just answer the question, please, Miss Fenton. Was her manner clear and sharp? Or was it vague? All right, vague. Good. So, you would describe Mrs. Truscott as being a lethargic, fussy, and somewhat vague sort of woman. Yeah. And she wasn't no different on the morning she took that tin to any other time I've seen her. You say your mother was prescribed modrium? Yeah. How many did she take each day? Same as her, one three times a day. 
And I suppose, like most people, when, when, when she was feeling particularly bad, she perhaps took uh, another couple to cheer herself up, hmm? Sometimes she did, yeah. Did you ever notice any difference in your mother's behaviour? Don't know, really. Well then, Miss Fenton, if you're unable to tell the difference when your mother takes an extra tablet or two of modrium, how can you possibly be expected to tell the difference when Mrs. Truscott does so? I don't know, do I? Yes. Now, Miss Fenton, you said that when you talked to Mrs. Truscott about her husband, she made some remark to the effect that he might advise her to plead not guilty. She said he'd bully her into pleading not guilty. Yes, well, you see, my client has no remembrance of uttering such a remark. Can't help that, she still said it. So you claim. You also claim that Mrs. Truscott told you it was her intention to plead guilty. Not in so many words, no. No. It was just your interpretation of a remark which my client denies having made in the first instance. Dr. Morton, you are the defendant's GP? Yes. Did you prescribe tranquilizers for Mrs. Truscott? Yes. For how long? Dr. Morton? Uh, approximately five years. And for what condition were these tranquilizers prescribed? Your Honour, this is the first time I've been called to give evidence at a trial. There's a first time for everything, Dr. Morton. I hope I'm right in my belief that I won't be expected to answer questions which would involve revealing confidential information about one of my patients. You are a witness for the prosecution, Doctor. I think, sir, in fairness to the witness, I should point out that Dr. Morton has been subpoenaed for the prosecution. Ah, you did not wish to give evidence at this trial. No, sir, I did not. Well, now that you are here, Doctor, I must point out to you that whatever power to induce silence the Hippocratic Oath may have in the groves of academic medicine, it certainly has no such power in this court. Although, of course, you will not be called upon to reveal information about Mrs. Truscott that is not strictly germane to the facts of this case, I must ask you to answer all counsel's questions unless I rule otherwise. Ms. Davenport. Dr. Morton, you say you've been prescribing tranquilizers to Mrs. Truscott for the past five years? Yes. For what condition were these drugs prescribed? Mrs. Truscott suffers from situational stress. Situational stress? Yes. That's a minor anxiety state brought about by her personal circumstances. A minor anxiety state? Yes. Not sufficient to warrant her being sent to see a psychiatrist, for example? No. No. And for this minor anxiety state, you prescribed? Uh, modrium, a minor tranquilizer. At what dosage did you prescribe the drug? Five milligrams, three times a day. And what effect does modrium have at this dosage? Well, in common with other drugs of the benzodiazepine group, when you first start taking modrium, you experience a certain amount of drowsiness, lightheadedness, uh, but these effects wear off after a week or so. So if Mrs. Truscott had been taking these drugs over a five-year period, she would have become acclimatised to the drug, so to speak. In most respects, yes. Although there is evidence that the ability to drive a car continues to be impaired. And I advised Mrs. Truscott to be very careful when she drove. I see. Now, would someone taking modrium at this dosage for a number of years be in a sufficiently drowsy or absent-minded mental condition to put a tin of salmon into her shopping bag and walk out of a supermarket without paying for it? Well, that would vary. The effect of the drug can change from one week to the next. And why would that be? Well, the drug's only one factor in the equation. In any case of situational stress, the personal circumstances of the patient are an equally important factor. In that case, Dr. Morton, what are these personal circumstances? Well. For example, is the continuing stress bound up with the defendant's change of life? Oh, no. Mrs. Truscott isn't suffering from menopausal depression. Her change of life had been completed some time earlier. Then what were the circumstances when she came to you as a patient? Well, she complained of a feeling of panic and that she couldn't cope with life anymore. Yes, well, we all have those feelings at some time or another, Dr. Morton. There must have been more to it than that, surely. Are those Mrs. Truscott's medical notes you have there, Doctor? Yes, sir, they are. 
May I glance at them, please? For example, did you prescribe tranquilizers to the defendant to alleviate anxiety caused by bad housing? Or poverty? Maybe vandalism? Hardly. Mrs. Truscott's husband had just been adopted as parliamentary candidate for Fulchester North, and she found the role of political hostess rather beyond her. As I assessed the situation as only being a temporary one, I prescribed modrim, five milligrams, three times a day, just to tide her over. And you continue to prescribe these tranquilizers for Mrs. Truscott to help her cope with this demanding new role in her husband's life? Yes. For five years? Yes. Do any of your patients ever say to you, Doctor, will it be all right if I take an extra tablet or two if ever I feel particularly bad? Yes, quite often. And did Mrs. Truscott ever say this to you? Yes. And what did you tell her? I told her it would be most unwise, that she'd start feeling drowsy, light-headed again, as if she'd had a few drinks too many. So all your prescriptions to Mrs. Truscott over this five-year period have been for five milligrams of modrium three times daily? Yes. In that case, Dr. Morton, to return to my original question. Would someone who had become acclimatized to modrium at this dosage over a number of years be in a drowsy or sufficiently absent-minded mental condition to put a tin of salmon into her shopping bag and walk out of a supermarket without paying for it? And as I said before, the effect of the drug can change if there are significant changes in the patient's personal circumstances. Had there, immediately prior to the morning of the 18th, been any such changes in Mrs. Truscott's personal circumstances? Not as far as I know, but then Mrs. Truscott hadn't been to consult me for, well, I haven't got my medical notes at the moment. I think it was about three weeks. Yes, that's correct, three weeks. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Will you wait there, please? Yes, Doctor, was, uh, was Mr. Truscott violent towards his wife on more than one occasion. Sir? Look, your entries are uh, somewhat epigrammatic, but there is one here for September last year which says, am I dealing with the right patient? And another one for November the 30th which says quite clearly, violent episode with the husband. Well, there was no violence on the part of Mr. Truscott. Then how do you explain this entry? Um, on the 30th of November last year, Mrs. Truscott came to see me and said I would have to prescribe something stronger for her. I asked her what was the matter, and she said things were getting on top of her. I told her I was very reluctant to change her treatment, but she said that something had happened which was causing her great concern. Yes? A few days earlier, she'd flown into a fit of uncontrollable rage, during which she'd first kicked the cat and then thrown a tin opener across the room at her husband. It hit Mr. Truscott, causing a gash in his cheek, which required treatment, including five stitches, at the casualty ward of Fulchester General Hospital. Tomorrow, you can join us again when the Queen against Truscott will be resumed in the Crown Court.
The case you're about to see is a fictional one, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. Mrs. Barbara Truscott is accused of stealing a tin of salmon from a branch of Paradise Supermarkets, Fulchester. Her husband is a solicitor who has instructed her counsel that at the time of the alleged theft, Mrs. Truscott was taking tranquilizers on prescription from her doctor and that she was not fully aware of her actions. Yesterday, Dr. Avril Morton, Mrs. Truscott's GP, gave evidence for the prosecution and today she'll be cross-examined by counsel for the defence. Well, Dr. Morton, as you know, we have taken the extra precaution of having Mrs. Truscott examined by our own specialist. And you'll no doubt be interested to learn that he has, in fact, confirmed your diagnosis of situational stress to be correct. Thank you. Now, Dr. Morton, I wonder if... No, 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 later, later. I'll use it later. Now, I'm sorry, Dr. Morton, I was just uh, mulling over with my instructing solicitor a point concerning your earlier evidence in relation to the unfortunate accident with the uh, tin opener. I shall probably return to that point later on, but um, for the moment, just tell me this, will you? You've been issuing repeat prescriptions for tranquilizers to Mrs. Truscott regularly for the past five years, since the autumn of 1972, is that right? Uh, yes, since November the 14th, 1972, to be exact. Yes. Now, on that date, when Mrs. Truscott first came to you for help about her feelings of anxiety, she didn't demand to be put on tranquilizers, did she? No. No, that was your decision. Yes. Taking the overall situation into account, I thought that a four-week course of modrim was the best way to tide her over for the time being. Well, then why did you issue any further prescriptions for this drug? Well, shortly before the four weeks were up, on December the 8th, 1972, Mrs. Truscott returned to say that the pills were helping her, and please could she have some more? And so you promptly wrote her out a repeat prescription? No. I told Mrs. Truscott that I didn't think tranquilizers were a continuing solution to her problem. And she then explained to me that it wasn't just the problem of her husband's political career that was causing the anxiety. Um, her daughter had just left home to study at one of the London Polytechnics, and Mrs. Truscott felt that part of her life was finished forever. I see, and then you wrote out a repeat prescription. Yes. Yes. I suppose you had a full waiting room that morning. I've no idea, but I do remember spending a great deal of time talking to Mrs. Truscott. I told her that she should only take tranquilizers when she was going through a bad patch and that she shouldn't start taking them regularly as a sort of safeguard against a bout of anxiety which might not occur. Yes, but over the years, Dr. Morton, you must have known that Mrs. Truscott was using these drugs regularly. Yes, and over the years, Mr. Carrigan, I made many attempts to stop Mrs. Truscott taking tranquilizers. But she showed great resistance to this. Well, if you thought that the correct procedure was for her to be taken off modrium, why did you not simply stop the prescription? She was very unhappy. Her daughter, by this time, had finished her course at the Polytechnic and had taken up a teaching post in South Africa. Mrs. Truscott's whole life now revolved around her husband, and she felt that without tranquilizers, she could not continue to support him in the way she wished to do. I was left with very little alternative in terms of treating the overall situation. Oh, really? Those repeat prescriptions were as much for your benefit as for Mrs. Truscott's. Yes, yes, all right, Dr. Morton, all right. Mr. Truscott, do not let me have to warn you again about that sort of provocation. Now, Dr. Morton, you've just been talking about consultations which took place in September 1976. Yes, sir. Now, right, this was the time when you jotted a query down in Mrs. Truscott's medical records. Let me see. Am I dealing with the right patient? Yes. Quite often, in a partnership, one of the partners will present for treatment when it is really the other one that needs the help. Are you saying that... Mr. Truscott should have been on tranquilizers rather than his wife? Well, I've no idea, but um, I'm not his doctor. But it's no secret that he'd just been defeated in the parliamentary by-election and his predecessor had held the seat with a majority of two or three thousand, I believe. Yes. Mr. Carrigan. 
Yes, in any event, Dr. Morton, you continue to issue repeat prescriptions to Mrs. Truscott. Yes. And all of these prescriptions were for five milligrams three times a day. Yes. You said earlier, Dr. Morton, that even with someone who had become acclimatized to taking modrium at this level for some years, the effect of the drug might change from week to week according to the personal circumstances. Yes. And that you'd not seen Mrs. Truscott for three weeks prior to the alleged theft? Yes. Yes, and you also told us that the effect of taking an extra tablet or two of modrium would be to make Mrs. Truscott feel drowsy, light-headed, as though she'd had one or two drinks too many. Yes. Now, suppose Mrs. Truscott had undergone a disturbing experience um, during the evening immediately prior to the day of the alleged theft, and that she'd slept scarcely at all during the night, and that she'd felt so irritable and anxious the next morning that she'd felt it necessary to take an extra couple of tablets of modrium simply to get herself out of the house. What exactly are you asking me? Well, under those circumstances, wouldn't Mrs. Truscott have been sufficiently drowsy, light-headed, prepossessed as to slip a tin of salmon accidentally into her shopping bag? Sir? Yes, Miss Davenport, Mr. Carrigan, you know perfectly well that question in the way in which you have framed it is not for the witness, but for the jury to decide. Yes, now, Dr. Morton, apart from your repeated warnings to beware taking modrium while driving a motor car, did you proffer Mrs. Truscott any more comprehensive information? What do you mean? Well, for example, did you tell her that over 19 million prescriptions of tranquilizers are prescribed by doctors like you every year, costing the country nine and a half million pounds, and that doctors like you are also under constant sales pressure from the manufacturing companies to prescribe these drugs? No, but I did tell her that one out of every four middle-aged women is taking tranquilizers for one reason or another, and that doctors like me are under great pressure from patients like her to prescribe them. Now, apart from drowsiness and light-headedness, did you warn Mrs. Truscus in advance about any of these side effects? Blurred vision, dry mouth, garrulousness, together with slurred speech. Well, those side effects are relatively uncommon. But yes, I did warn Mrs. Truscott about them, and I advised her not to step up the prescribed dose. Now, you didn't at any stage say, Mrs. Truscott, you must never exceed the prescribed dose. I told her it would be unwise for her to do so. Mrs. Dr. Morton, did you ever instruct Mrs. Truscott never to do so? I warned her not to do so. In the same way that you warned her about the possibility of a paradoxical rage reaction. Well, you, you can't warn patients about every possible side effect in advance. Why, they might be too frightened to take the drug in the first place. Nevertheless, at the risk of scaring everyone assembled here today, uh, would you like to explain this uh, medical phenomenon to the court? Well, as I say, the simplest way to understand the effect of a drug like Modrim is to substitute for the word tranquilizer, the word alcohol. Now, there are times when an intake of either of those drugs can calm you down, and other occasions on which it can make you feel very aggressive. It depends on the situation in which you find yourself. We have had some reports recently of mothers taking tranquilizers who've attacked their children due to an inability to cope with a baby's endless crying. And one report of a tranquilized husband who beat up his wife for the first time after nearly 20 years of marriage. But in any case, it's only over the last sort of couple of years that the medical profession has taken the incidence of tranquilizer-induced aggression at all seriously. And it's still probably a very, very rare occurrence. Yes, but on these rare occasions, a mother or a loving spouse can be transformed into a dangerous aggressor merely by taking these drugs. No, not merely by taking these drugs. It is a combination of the drug, the personality and the situation. In the case of Mrs. Truscott, she lost her temper because her cat would not eat a new brand of cat food that she'd bought for it. She kicked the cat and she threw the tin opener across the room. 
It bounced off the wall and it caused a gash in Mr Truscott's cheek. Yes, and that was a, an involuntary reaction for which the tranquilizers were directly responsible, Dr Morton. And as you've said, Mrs Truscott could not be held to blame in any way. Well, the tranquilizers may have been directly responsible. And that is how I put it to Mrs Truscott. I also told her that she mustn't feel that a paradoxical rage reaction was her fault. And I told her that I thought she should come off tranquilizers for a while. Mrs. Truscott disagreed with my interpretation of the events. She felt that she'd really intended to harm her husband. That is why she felt guilty, and that is why she wanted stronger tranquilizers. Yeah, but it's perfectly natural, isn't it, to feel a sense of guilt when you've injured someone you love, and to worry about whether or not the act might have been intentional. Possibly. It doesn't follow from that, does it, Dr. Morton, that Mrs. Truscott had intended to injure her husband? Or that she had intended to steal the tin of salmon? Because that was, surely, as you say, the result of an unfortunate conjunction of circumstances. Like the cylinders of a, a combination lock clicking into place. I'm afraid only Mrs. Truscott can answer that question for you. What is your religion? Church of England. Uh, would you remove your gloves, Mrs. Truscott? My gloves? Yes, please. Just that one will do. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is your full name Barbara May Truscott? Yes, sir. And do you live at 25 Hurstmanso Court, Wentworth, Fulchester? Yes, sir. Are you a lady with no previous convictions whatsoever? No. What was that, Mrs. Truscott? I said no, sir. And when you say no, Mrs. Truscott, you mean you have no previous convictions, is that correct? Yes. Now, when you give your evidence, Mrs. Truscott, I would like you to speak as loudly and distinctly as you can, because if I have difficulty hearing you, the members of the jury must be having even greater difficulty. Yes, yes, sir. Mrs. Truscott, a somewhat unchivalrous question, perhaps, but uh, would you object if the court were to be told your age? No, I wouldn't object. And you are? Uh, 51. 52 next January. Uh, now, uh, Philip never forgets my birthday. Oh, does he not? Or our wedding anniversary. I see. And when were you married, Mrs. Truscott? Uh, February the 23rd, 1952. I'd given up teaching at the infant school at the end of the term before. How would you describe your marriage? Very happy. I've always tried to do my best for my husband and my family. Yes. Now, Dr. Morton has told us, hasn't she, how you first approached her for assistance in coping with the additional wifely duties necessitated by your husband's involvement with politics. Yes, sir. I don't think she really understood what I wanted, though. She just put me on to tranquilizers. That wasn't what you wanted? No. But Dr. Morton has said that you refused to stop taking tranquilizers. Dr. Morton was very understanding. I, I told Philip that. She was very sympathetic to everything that I told her. It's just that I needed something more positive. Tranquilizers don't solve anything. They just keep you going from day to day, don't yes, they? In other words, Mrs. Truscott, you weren't happy, were you, to be on a perpetual regime of five milligrams of modrium three times a day? That was all she ever prescribed for me. Yes. Now, you heard Dr. Morton say earlier on, when talking about the incident with the tin opener, that you told her you were worried you might have intended to harm your husband. Do you still have that same worry now? No. I see now that it was all caused by the drugs. Yes. Dr. Morton said it was a paradoxical rage reaction, didn't she? Yes. And something else you heard Dr. Morton say earlier was that she warned you 
not to take more than one tablet three times a day, otherwise you might start to feel drowsy, lightheaded, as though you'd had one or two drinks too many. Yes. Did she warn you to that effect? Only in relation to driving. And? I told her I don't drive. But did she give you a general warning not to exceed the prescribed dose? No. So you sometimes took an extra tablet or two of modrium in an emergency, so to speak? Yes. Yeah. And Dr. Morton has said, hasn't she, that the effect of even your normal regular dosage can be exaggerated depending upon the immediate circumstances? Yes. How many tablets did you take on the morning of the 18th? Three. That's two extra tablets. Yes. Why did you do that? Well, when I woke up, I was still feeling upset about the reporters. I'd hardly slept at all. The reporters, Mrs. Trusford? Yes, uh, from the Fulchester Gazette. It was our wedding, silver wedding anniversary, the, the following week, and they'd been round to interview us the night before. The night before the 18th, that is? Yes. yes. Now, why should an interview about your silver wedding cause you so much distress that you couldn't sleep? Well, it didn't at first. I told them that Philip was planning a special surprise. Every other year, you see, we'd gone to a concert at the City Hall. That was where we first met, just after the war when I was playing with the Fulchester Youth Orchestra and Phil was home on leave from his national service. They've uh, pulled the building down now, as you know. Then one of the reporters asked me what instrument I played with the youth orchestra and uh, I said the cello. Yes, Mrs. Truscott. They asked me if I still play it, and I said that I, I didn't really get much time to play now. Then the young reporter in the glasses and, and the T-shirt, he asked if he could take a picture of me um, with the cello. And everybody seemed to think that that was a good idea. So I went up to the spare room, and there was my cello propped up against the wall in its battered old canvas case. Did you bring the cello downstairs? Yes. Then they asked me what was my favourite piece of music for the cello, and I told them one of the Bach unaccompanied sonatas. And then the other reporter asked me if I would play a little of it for them. Did you do so? I was reluctant to at first, but eventually I... I hadn't played for some time, you see, and I knew that the soft skin on the top of... of the fingers of my left hand would be bound to hurt a little at first. You see, you have to press quite heavily on the strings as you change from one position to the next. I struggled away for a few minutes like an idiot. All those years of practice and lessons from the age of eight and now I... I kept thinking what a fool I was to allow myself to be persuaded imagining that I should still be able to play. After a few minutes, I stopped. The skin on the tops of my fingers was raw and torn and... Uh, painful, everything. I'm sure that everybody here will understand how disturbing it must all have been for you. No, I felt somehow that I'd... It was another way I'd failed, Philip. After the reporters had left Mrs. Truscott, did you then go to bed? Yes, I did, but it, um... It wasn't really any use. I hardly slept at all. Yes, and then what happened in the morning, Mrs. Truscott? Well, when I woke up, I, I felt perfectly all right at first, and then just before Philip left for work, I... It was panic session, so all I could do was take a couple of extra tablets to give me the courage to go out of the house. Yes, and later that morning you did go out of the house, didn't yes. you? Do you remember arriving at the Paradise supermarket? No, I... But you went there that morning, Mrs. Truscott? Yes, I don't remember arriving, though. I... Do you remember taking any items from the shelves and placing them in one of those little wire baskets? 
No, not really. I know I must have done, but I was in a sort of daydream all the time. I, I was thinking about the questions the reporters had asked and things we talked about from the past and wondering what Philip had planned for me. And Philippa, she, she wouldn't be able to join us this year because she was living so far away, or all that kind of thing. I Philippa think. is the name of your daughter, is that right? Yes. Do you remember standing in front of the shells with tin fish? Uh, yes, I think so. And do you remember turning your head from side to side, either to see if anyone was looking at you or else to clear your mind? No. Do you remember putting a seven and a half ounce tin of fancy grade paradise red salmon, priced at one pound sixteen p, into your shopping bag? No. Do you remember Mrs. Waterman stopping you outside in the street? Yes, yes, she was shouting at me. Now, why was that? Well, I suppose it's because I wasn't really listening to what she was saying. Is that why you said, don't speak so loudly to her? Yes, I expect so. Do you remember a conversation taking place with Miss Fenton in one of the offices? Yes. Do you remember anything you said to her? I'm not sure. You're not sure? Well, I've been listening to her in the witness box and... What I remember and what she said are now all jumbled up together. Yes, I, I remember she said, how will your old man react to this? Why do you remember that? Because I thought she was talking about my father and he died in 1955. Now, when Miss Fenton asked you that question about your husband, Mrs. Truscott, did you respond by saying, I expect he'll try to bully me into pleading not guilty? No. Did you at any time intend to plead guilty? No. Did you place the tin of salmon in your shopping bag with the intention of not paying for it? No. Join us again tomorrow when the Queen against Truscott will be concluded in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see is a fictional one, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public who will retire at the end of the trial to reach their own unrehearsed verdict. Mrs. Barbara Truscott is accused of stealing a tin of salmon from Paradise Supermarkets, Fulchester. Her husband, a solicitor, has instructed her counsel that at the time of the alleged theft, Mrs. Truscott was taking tranquilizers on prescription from her doctor and that she was not fully conscious of her actions. Mrs. Truscott is being cross-examined by counsel for the prosecution. Oh, I think after. And you heard Mrs. Waterman say that you appear to be in full control of your faculties at the time she apprehended you. Yes. And you also heard Miss Fenton say that she had often seen you in the Paradise supermarket and that you did not appear to her to be behaving any differently on that day to any other day. Yes. Then I put it to you, Mrs. Truscott, that you were not in a particularly distressed state of mind on the morning of the 18th, and that you did not take any extra tablets of modrium. No, I did. But Dr. Morton had warned you, hadn't she? When you asked her if it would be all right for you to take an extra tablet or two when you felt particularly bad, that that would be an unwise thing to do. Yes, but only in relation to driving. And I told her that I don't drive. Yes. You keep on saying that, don't you, Mrs. Truscott? Do I? I'm sorry. Mrs. Truscott, 
However Dr. Morton phrased her warning to you, she did tell you that if you occasionally took an extra tablet or two, you would feel drowsy and lightheaded as though you'd had a few drinks too many. Yes. So, on the occasions that you did take extra tablets, against Dr. Morton's advice, you knew the effect they would have on you. Yes, but I only took an extra tablet if I was particularly anxious about something. You claimed earlier, Mrs. Truscott, that you took two additional tablets on the morning of the alleged theft to give yourself the courage to go out of the house. Yes. Do you often take extra tablets to give yourself the courage to do things you might want to do, but which otherwise you might be afraid to do? Yes. Acts which might include intentionally throwing a tin opener at your husband, or intentionally stealing a tin of salmon yes, from the soup. Yes, Miss Davenport, I think that question is a matter for your address <clears throat> to the jury, don't you? Mrs. Truscott, when you told Dr. Morton about the incident with the tin opener, you said that in spite of her reassurances that it was a paradoxical rage reaction, you were still worried about the fact that you might have intended to harm your husband. Yes. yes. But you told my learned colleague that now you felt these worries were unfounded. Yes. When did you change your mind? I'm not sure. Did you change your mind as a result of anyone saying anything to you during the course of this trial? No, I didn't. Mrs. Truscott, this trial is not an enjoyable experience for you, is it? No. no. Have you at any stage at all during this trial wished that you had opted to plead guilty at the magistrate's court so that everything could be over and done with, so to speak? Mrs. Truscott, I put it to you that on the morning of the 18th of February, if you did take any extra tablets of modrium, you did so deliberately in order to give yourself the courage to commit an act of theft. No. And I further put it to you that when you were apprehended, your original intention was to plead guilty. No. But you've heard Miss Fenton say in court and on oath that you said to her, I suppose my husband will try to bully me into pleading not guilty. Did you say that? No. No. But since you claim to have taken two extra tablets of modrium that morning, and after all, you say you can't remember even picking up a tin of salmon and putting it into your shopping bag, or very much else for that matter, it is possible, isn't it, Mrs. Truscott, that you made that remark to Miss Fenton, but that you simply don't remember making it? I don't know. Was it, as Miss Fenton said, the case that you wanted to plead guilty, but that your husband has bullied you into pleading not guilty? Uh, sir. Yes, Mr. Carrigan. With the Carrigan. best will in the world, sir, my client cannot be required to answer that question. Since Mr. Truscott is her solicitor, <coughs> any conversations that took place between Mr. and Mrs. Truscott after her arrest are the subject of solicitor-client privilege. Yes. Mr. Davenport, I'm afraid Mr. Carrigan is absolutely right. I shall not allow that question. Yes? Mrs. Truscott, does your husband ever bully you? Philip? No, of course not. You live in a state of utter and complete connubial bliss. It is possible. Several times during the course of this trial, you have said that you do not drive, Mrs. Truscott. No, I don't. Why is that? Well, I've always been afraid that if I should start to learn, I might scrape the car or have a bump or something. Is that what Mr. Truscott says? Yes, it is, and, and I agree with him. I'm sure you do. Mrs. Truscott, tell me, where did you go for your holiday last year? To Corsica. Was that your idea? No, it was Philip's. Does Mr. Truscott always decide where you go for your holiday? Yes, of course he does. And the outfit that you're wearing today, Mrs. Truscott, is that your choice? No, I always rely on Philip to select my clothes for me. He has far better taste. And even your daughter is called Philippa, is she not? Yes. Another choice of your husband's, no doubt. 
No. That was my choice. Mrs. Truscott, did your husband ever tell you to stop using tranquilizers? No. Now, are you really saying, Mrs. Truscott, that you have never felt any resentment at all towards a man who has encouraged you to subjugate your personality to his? Probably throughout the whole of your married life. And who has allowed you, over the last few years, to become dependent on tranquilizers simply because it makes things easier for him that way? You're talking just like Philippa now, you know. Am I? Yes. She used to go on and on. You've no idea about how old-fashioned I was and how I must be a throwback to the age of Queen Victoria or something. She used to say that I ought to stand up and take a deep breath and say, stop. And what was your reply to that? I told her, Miss Davenport, that I thought she ought to wait until she was married before she started trying to tell me how to run my life. Yes. The interview in the Fuchster Gazette, Mrs. Truscott, was that your choice? No, but I was quite happy that there should be something printed in the paper to mark the occasion. I see. There's nothing wrong with being sentimental, is there? No, no, not at all. In fact, the reporter, who will remain nameless, writes here, Mrs. Truscott numbers among the happiest days of her life those just after the end of the war when she would cycle down to the old Swallowpool ground to watch her latest boyfriend playing cricket. In those days, she recalls, Phil used to believe he was the natural successor to Dennis Compton at number four for England, even though he was only playing for Fulchester Grammar School Old Boys Second Eleven. <laughs> Did you say all that, Mrs. Truscott? Yes. The reporter also writes, Mrs. Truscott, once the proud owner of many certificates for her prowess as a cello player, now has little time to indulge her former passion for music, but she loyally affirms, I'm happy to devote the whole of my life to helping my husband in his chosen career. Did you say all that as well, Mrs. Truscott? Yes. You'll forgive me for saying this, Mrs. Truscott, but surely a woman of your talents and sensitivity must have felt wounded, to say the least at being reduced in front of those two gentlemen from the Fulchester Gazette to being a mere mouthpiece, almost a ventriloquist doll, an accessory to your husband's career like a, like a cigarette lighter or a watch fob. This is ludicrous. Mr. Truscott. With all respect, Mr. I find it to understand. You're doing your wife's case no good at all by continuing to behave in this fashion. At the risk of being accused of undue leniency towards a member of the legal profession, I will give you one last chance, but be warned. Another interruption and you will leave this court. Ah, Miss Davenport, I think I've allowed you a great deal of leeway. I do think you ought now to put whatever point it is you're seeking to make to Mrs. Truscott, don't you? Mrs. Truscott, is it not the case that during your 25 years of marriage you have suffered a great deal of humiliation? No. And is it not also the case that on many occasions, including the incident with the tin opener, you have found yourself intentionally attempting to revenge yourself on your husband? No. And I put it to you that the interview on the evening before the 18th was the final degradation that broke even your loyal back. And that when you took that tin of salmon, you did so intending to steal it and intending to plead guilty in order to punish your husband by humiliating him publicly and in open court. No. That's not what it was at all. Strange. Hmm? Remembering that. Yes. Taking the tin of salmon from the shelf and the picture that flashed through my mind at that moment. Mrs. Truscott? No, they'll laugh at me again. Nobody will laugh, I assure you. No? No. It was the memory of a cricket match. A cricket match? Yes, I told the reporters about it only the night before. 
Then you must be referring to this passage, Mrs. Truscott. Mrs. Truscott remembers one particular day when she missed her husband's highest ever innings while she was chatting away in the pavilion helping the other girls prepare the sandwiches for tea. She recalls that in those bygone days of rationing and utility clothes, they had to use chicken and salmon paste because real chicken and salmon were so difficult to obtain in those austere post-war years. She turns to her husband with a smile full of sad nostalgia and says, if only it were possible to bring back those days when we were first in love. Is that what you are thinking about, Mrs. Truscott? Yes. And then you took the tin of salmon? Yes. You, you took it to make him love you again? I'm sorry. Mrs. Truscott, did you take that tin of salmon because in some way or other you believed it might help you recapture the past? I have no idea. Mrs. Truscott. Uh, sir, uh, I find myself in a little difficulty here. Yes, Mr. Carrigan, I can understand that. Yes, I would like to call Mr. Philip Truscott as a witness for the defence. What? But you inform the court earlier on, specifically, would not be calling to give evidence for the defence. Yes, I realise that, sir. And Mr. Truscott has been sitting in court whilst all the other witnesses have given that evidence. Yes, I appreciate that too, sir, but uh, the prosecution have made certain allegations which can only be dealt with by my calling Mr. Truscott to the witness box. I see. Well. Mr. Davenport, do you have any objection to Mr. Truscott being called as a witness? No, sir. Very well, I think that now would be a convenient time to adjourn for lunch, and when we meet again, you may proceed. And after both you and your wife had spent a sleepless night, Mr. Truscott, what happened in the morning? Well, just before leaving for work, I noticed that instead of taking one tranquilizer with her morning coffee, she took three. Uh, now, to come to the incident of the tin opener, did your wife ever say anything to you about being afraid she might have intended to harm you? No, and I'm quite sure she did not intend to do so. Why are you so certain? Well, the whole manner in which the incident occurred. She simply lost her temper with the cat, threw the tin opener across the room, and it rebounded from the kitchen wall to catch me on the cheek. It was obviously quite accidental. Has your wife ever shown any signs of hostility towards you during the years of your marriage? No. She has been the perfect wife, helping me in every possible way, both in my career as a solicitor and my career as a politician. Now, before you decided that you would take upon yourself the burden of instructing solicitor in your wife's case, did your wife ever indicate to you at any time that she would prefer to plead guilty? No, quite the opposite. She has maintained from the very beginning that she's innocent. Thank you, Mr. Truscott. <clears throat> Mr. Truscott. Yes. Was your 25th wedding anniversary celebration an enjoyable one? Yes, thank you. What did you and your wife finally decide to do? Well, since the city hall was in the process of being demolished at that time, we went to Stratford-upon-Avon for the weekend, and that is where we shall be going every year in future, until we have a council back in power which does not take such a Philistine attitude towards the arts. Mr. Truscott, just answer council's questions, will you? Do not endeavour to score party political points. Was Stratford-upon-Avon your idea or Mrs. Truscott's? Mine, of course. Uh, it was a surprise. I see. I think perhaps I should make it clear, young lady, that however committed to the ideals of women's liberation you might be, my wife was and is entirely happy with the working arrangement upon which our marriage is based. 
And I might add that we have always seen eye to eye on matters not just concerning the arts, but politics as well, whether they be conceived within the microcosm of the family or the macrocosm of society. For example, my daughter Philippa would often quote Engels at me, within the marriage the husband is the bourgeois, the wife the proletariat. And my wife would spring to my defence, saying, and no bad thing either. Yes. Your daughter would appear to be another young lady with committed ideals. I notice in the article the Fulchester Gazette mentions that she had then just given up her teaching position in South Africa to do voluntary work amongst the poor blacks in the Transkei. We're both very proud of Philippa. Idealism is a credit to the young. As long as it is exercised with responsibility and not employed willfully in courts of law in the attempt to make the whole of human behaviour fit one narrow set of beliefs. Do you think that you might, Mr Truscott, at any time have muffled or muted Mrs Truscott's abilities and personality by an overbearing application of your own narrow set of beliefs? Well, let me say this, and let me make it quite clear. I have never, at any stage, forced my wife to do anything or forego anything. I'm sure the members of the jury are interested to hear your theories, Mr Truscott, particularly when applied to your wife's dreams and longings. Well, everyone has dreams when they're young. You might be surprised to hear it. I even had them myself. But maturity, as you will discover one day, is an attaining an age when you come to realize that the only possible line of action is one of continual compromise between dreams and reality, between what is desired and what is possible. If, uh, if there is a gap between the two and the individual human being cannot bridge the gap, then, um, and, and my wife and I have always been uh, agreed upon this point, uh, then one has to learn to accede gracefully to the inevitable. Uh, this realization has nothing whatsoever to do with any question of... Uh... Sir? Yes, what is it, Mr. Carrigan? I'm afraid that uh, I'm compelled to ask uh, whether my client might be allowed to withdraw from the court. Uh, she's feeling too unwell to remain, is that it? Uh, she thinks she might have taken an overdose of modrium, sir. You mean she isn't sure? Well, sir, uh, before lunch, her bottle of tablets was half full, but uh, now it seems to be empty. She can't recall what happened, but uh, I don't think we can rule out the possibility that she might have taken them. I see. Uh, Dr. Morton has said that the amount of drug involved will not be lethal, but uh, she thinks Mrs. Truscott ought to be taken to the Fulchester General Hospital so that the proper medical investigations can be carried out. Very well, Mr. Carrigan. We'd better get there as quickly as possible, hadn't we? I think it might be advisable, Miss Davenport, if we broke at this point, don't you? And then you could continue your cross-examination tomorrow morning. In the light of what has just happened, sir, I don't think it will be necessary to put any further questions to this witness. Do you intend to re-examine Mr. Carrigan? No, sir. Well, in that case, Mr. Truscott, I think you may be permitted to leave the witness box and accompany your wife to hospital. I'm obliged to, sir. Oh, Mr. Carrigan, you're not proposing to call any more witnesses, are you? No, sir. In that case, perhaps the best course of action might be to proceed with the trial in Mrs. Truscott's absence, provided, of course, that you both agree. And uh, I would remind you, members of the jury, that although there have been moments in this trial which may have seemed to you to be somewhat dramatic, that you must not let such moments, nor any feeling either of anger or pity, influence your considerations. The question for you is for you to feel satisfied that you are sure that Mrs. Truscott was aware of what she was doing, or whether, even if she was not aware, that she had previously made up her mind to do this thing and then had taken a couple of extra tablets of modrium to give herself courage. 
Unless you're satisfied on one of these points, your verdict must be one of not guilty. Now, where a person takes an article from a supermarket without paying for it, that is some evidence of theft, and that is undisputed in this case. And the question for you to decide is whether you think Mrs. Truscott's explanation is satisfactory. Remember, if you have any reasonable doubt about it whatsoever, you must find the defendant not guilty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict. Will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Very well. Now, in that event, it will not now be necessary to call upon Mrs. Truscott to return to this court. Sir. Yes, Mr. Carrigan. Uh, the verdict of the jury being in favour of my client, doubtless you will make the usual order that the prosecution should pay my client's costs? No, Mr. Carrigan. That is the usual order, but this is not the usual case. I am of the opinion that your clients have brought this prosecution upon themselves, and therefore they must pay their own costs. Oh, sir.